Hi, um, I am just doing my usual, uh, having my usual internet problems. So I'm hoping it's going to resolve itself. It never, never a problem all week until it comes time to do a live stream. But um, yeah, tell me in the comments if it's if it's too terrible, and I'll switch uh, to my mobile phone data. But anyway, I'll um, introduce Helena properly in a second. But first of all, I'll just uh, give a thanks to the sponsor of today's live stream, which is, as always, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. WeatherGuard makes drag tape, a retrofitable lightning protection system for things that go fast, like wind turbine blades and aircraft. So today um, with Helena, we're going to be talking about social license, community acceptance, and NIMBYism, not in my backyard. So I just want to start with a viewer question for everybody watching. Let me know where you're watching from and what do you think about the concept of NIMBY, not in my backyard? Do you think it's fair enough if people want to veto projects in their own community? Um, is it a big problem where you live? And if you have yeah, examples of this issue where you live, then I would like to hear them in, yeah, in the comments. Okay, so Elena, um, can you please tell us a bit about what you do and um, yeah, your, your background, what led you to where you are today? Yeah, of course. Um, so I have a double degree in clinical and environmental psychology. And I currently work as an energy social scientist at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. And um, there I'm focusing on the topic of social implications of wind energy. Um, in fact, I'm doing a, a PhD uh, there. And in my research, I um, especially focus on airborne wind energy, which I believe you have already talked about in two of your other videos. So maybe some of your viewers know what it is. It's quite a, a new renewable energy technology. Yeah, cool. Okay. So um, social license is a term that comes up in nearly every conference session that I've attended at clean energy conferences in recent years. I think there's an impression that the wind industry especially just did a really, really terrible job with community engagement in the early days of wind, at least in Australia. Um, we had big problems with uh, something called wind turbine syndrome, which uh, every Australian, maybe Americans, British people probably know what that is. But I know when I moved to Denmark, nobody had even heard that term, which I thought was so refreshing. Um, yeah, so that I uh, actually got, there's a, oh, actually I had it brought up, but I don't. A anyway, wind turbine syndrome was blamed for, I think there was a list of 247 different um, symptoms that were blamed on, yeah, the infrasound from wind turbines. And I, I don't know, I never hear anybody complaining about it anymore. So I guess that that problem went away. But I think that um, we learned, in the wind industry at least, learned that it's not enough for you to say, oh, that problem isn't real, that doesn't exist. You know, wind energy is great because if the community doesn't want it, then that's going to cause um, problems for you. So at least, you know, we're seeing a lot of people pay attention to it now. Um, and, yeah, I think recently, though, I've started to see um, a lot more community opposition to transmission lines. Um, hold on, I did want to share. Yeah, I saw this one on, on Reddit, this um, company Osnet, that's uh, a transmission line in, um, yeah, that they're trying to build in Australia. So this farmer does not want it going over his land and there are a lot of community protests. Um, and then I also on the weekend, I was driving down the coast um, through um, this area, Monaro, which is just apparently a natural, naturally treeless plain. Um, I had assumed that this area was cleared for farming, um, but yeah, apparently it's just naturally like that. Um, and there were signs up saying, you know, we don't, this is a scenic corridor, we don't want any wind energy here. Um, and yeah, I don't know, I thought that was a bit funny because I'm driving on this big road, you know, through farmland. Neither of those things are exactly natural either so you know I would also prefer to look at unspoilt natural views but I also accept that I've got to eat and I want to be able to drive to the coast so I have to accept farms and um and food so yeah that was just kind of my my personal um yeah personal kind of insight to what's going on um with community license and community acceptance of 
of these kind of things. And then actually there was one other thing that I wanted to share that someone from the Engineering with Rosie Patreon group shared um, about, I'll just bring up the, the website. Um, it's about in Britain, they're not as keen on um, onshore wind as you know, maybe we are elsewhere and they've just changed the the rules around this. So yeah, someone shared this article. Uh, yeah, they're trying trying to bring on more onshore wind, but it's not universally loved in England anyway. So that's supposed to just kind of set the stage for why I wanted to talk about this topic. And then I, yeah, like you said, Elena, we met when um, I was researching the video for Airborne Wind Energy and um, I just thought that was interesting because, you, you know, in the kind of people that I talk to, like me, you know, developing projects or um, working on renewable energy technologies, everybody thinks that NIMBY is a huge problem. It's just kind of taken for granted that this is, um, yeah, that this is a big, serious issue. And I heard, hear the term a lot in renewable energy podcasts I listen to or um, articles I read or on LinkedIn. And I just literally never questioned that that was, you know, a thing. Um, just seems so obvious. But when we were talking, you mentioned to me that you had some, um, yeah, you'd read <laughs> read some real research on the topic and it wasn't necessarily exactly the way that we all seem to think it is. So that's what made me want to hear from you. I'm interested to hear about actual research on the topic. So yeah, today we're going to talk about the effect of community ownership and other financial participation on local acceptance, community engagement, best and actual practices, and NIMBY effects. Um, so I might just quickly see if we've got some good comments. Um, yeah, we've got, okay, so I like to see by says, oh, it's from, calling him from Rose Bay, nice place. <laughs> NIMBY is not a problem till it blocks someone's view. Um, and then Mike Klein says, an inter interesting situation with well-known solar farms and resistance to solar farms because farmers and urbanites find them an eyesore and potential reclamation issues. Um, and Peter Ross in Orange, New South Wales, it's a real issue and hear about it all the time in this area. Um, yeah, okay, so those are some good snapshots. I also... Oh, actually, I'll I'll say that for later. I was going to bring up the polls that I did on YouTube and and Twitter, but let's um let's hear from you first, Elena, about let's not just talk so much about what we all think, uh, you know, feel to be true. Um, what can you tell me? Let's start with the you know most controversial um, nimbyism. So maybe you can start by defining what that is, because I think that's probably the Key, key point to figuring out if it's real or not is to know what exactly we're talking about. Yeah, of course. Uh, so you already said in the beginning, NIMBY stands for not in my backyard. And it refers to a person, uh, an individual who opposes uh, renewable energy infrastructure or any other large infrastructure for that matter, um, when it's really close to their own living environment. So close, close to their house uh, or almost in their backyard, so to say. Um, and you also said earlier that it's often taken for granted that this is an explanation for why people would oppose such an infrastructure. Um, and it's become kind of my hobby horse to refute it and to tell people about why NIMBYism is really just an oversimplification for it. Can um, I just ask um, one, one clarification? And this is also a question from um, someone from the Patreon team. Um, does NIMBY mean it's, it's okay, like you like the technology, it's okay in somebody else's backyard, but you just don't want it near you. It, it, that, it doesn't apply to people who just hate wind energy in general, people who, you know, just um, hate transmission lines in anywhere that they're installed. That wouldn't be NIMBY, right? It's only if you are okay with it in general, but not, not near you. Yeah, I think nowadays the term, because it's become a very popular concept in the media, but also in public discourse, it's, it's kind of applied to any form of uh, opposition to renewable energies. But really kind of the origin of the concept refers to an individual who is okay with a technology or an infrastructure as long as it's not too close to their own home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. um, yeah, so, so by default, uh, NIMBYism implies that there's this direct relationship between how close somebody lives to a proposed or an existing development um, and what their attitude is towards that development. 
So um, in simple words, the closer you live, the more you should be opposed to the development, right? Um, but in reality, it's not as simple as that. Um, so usually the people who are opposed to a development are the people who have a stake in the situation, right? And those are, of course, usually locals because they're most directly affected. But it can also be, you know, stakeholders that live a bit further away or that are not even, you know, from the region, but they have a stake in that specific area, such as like a nature protection association or maybe farmers who uh, own and use the land or people that like to go hiking in the area, you know, whatnot. Um, so while opposition is somewhat locally concentrated, research actually ha hasn't found any convincing evidence for this direct negative correlation between someone's attitudes um, and someone's distance to a development. Okay, so what kinds of, um, like how, how do they assess that? Um, you, you know, are people sending surveys to, to people and noting down, you know, their address, how far away they are, or what's the kind of methodology? Um, yeah, so it usually, this kind of research usually relies on surveys and they can be done in a number of ways. So you could uh, really drop by people's houses and ask them to fill in a questionnaire, come back and pick it up later, or uh, you mail a questionnaire to their address, um, or you ask them to fill in a, a survey online and they just put in their uh, postal code and their exact address. So yeah, there are a number of ways that you can that you can uh, look into this. Yeah. Can you still hear me, Rosie? I can again. Yeah, you just froze for a minute. Sorry. I'm sure that everybody else could still hear you. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just me and maybe some of my, um, some of the viewers that are also in Australia because, um, yeah, I never had this problem when I was living in Denmark. That's for sure. The <laughs> internet just works there. But anyway, um, yeah, it's a bit of an ongoing theme and my live streams nearly every week recently or every, every live stream it's happened. Okay. So, um, there's not a direct link between how close you are to a project and um, whether you oppose it or not. But you did mention that the people who oppose it are usually the ones who are affected, which is the, you know, the community. Um, and definitely there are um, plenty of, yeah, when you see protests, you often do see locals are the ones protesting so can we interpret from that that they would be protesting it anywhere that this project would be proposed? Or, you know, that would be maybe they wouldn't protest it because they wouldn't have any reason to, but they're the same types of people that would um, not be interested in, you know, more wind farms or more transmission lines in general or solar farms if that's that's a problem. Like how would how do you interpret that? Um, well, of course, you always have this small group of people who are generally opposed to renewables, so they don't want them anywhere, not near them, but also not elsewhere. Mm. But when you look at the research, what you uh, what you will see is that the majority of people um, actually supports renewable energies uh, at a general level. Um, mm. But also when you survey people that live close to renewable energy plants, such as wind turbines, their attitudes mm. on average is neutral to somewhat positive. So you see that the majority of people is actually in favor also of local projects. Um, but there seems to be somewhat of um, yeah, a misrepresentation in media because uh, usually the critical voices are the loudest voices. So that's mm. what the media tends to pick up. Um, and then that can also shift social norms, right? Because people start to think like, oh, everybody seems to be against renewable energies and uh, my neighbor is against renewable energies. Maybe I should also be against renewable energies. But when you really look at the statistics, you will see that most people are in favor of renewable energies and also of local projects. But the question is always, um, are they satisfied with how a specific project is implemented? And that's really what it mainly comes down to. Uh, okay. I mean, you're obviously not going to make a news story about how locals didn't protest a, a wind farm that was being built. So I guess that should be obvious. Um, I just wanted to share my own incredibly scientific um, study that I have done, which is by putting a couple of posts on um, YouTube community post and also on Twitter. Uh, I'll do the Twitter one first. Um, I gave three. I said, "How do you feel about renewable energy projects like wind and solar farms and new transmission lines?" Three options: we need more everywhere, 
to we need more but not here and locals always oppose. Um, Twitter only lets you have 25 characters, which is not enough to, to write a, um, a poll response option. So I meant by that that, you know, um, yeah, NIMBY is a problem basically that people don't want them near near them. Um, and yeah, pretty much everyone just said we need more everywhere. Um, and yeah, somebody commented, wouldn't mind a wind turbine with inside of my home, um, especially if I meant I could buy a small stake in it or get some of the electricity cheaper. And I know where I lived in Denmark, I could definitely see wind turbines um, from my home. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, nobody in Denmark has a problem um, with them, and a lot of Danish people do have community stake in them as well. There is a pretty good um, like community ownership model there, so that was interesting. Um, and then over on YouTube, I did two two polls. Um, first one was how do you feel about renewable energy projects, which is like in general, and then um, I did another one how do you feel about renewable projects in your own community. Um, so in general, people say 73% of people said we need many more, put them wherever they're needed and do it fast. And then when it's about in your own community, 77% said we need more renewables, bring it on. So that's like a, a YIMBY effect. We um, got <laughs> more, more people want them, um, yeah, nearby than want them in general. Obviously, it's a pretty small sample and not at all representative. But, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. And, uh, yes, a lot of the... The comments also mentioned, um, I mean, a few people were concerned about citing them correctly and, you know, that we shouldn't just, um, you know, have more and more um, stuff to solve the climate crisis, but maybe a bit less. But, yeah, in general, you can see that overwhelmingly people just recognise that we need more renewables. Um, yeah, so I guess, well, given that it's not, not really a thing. Um, do you have any theory about why that has just become so pervasive that, if, I mean, I'm sure, like, and people watching tell me, like, did were you surprised to hear that um, NIMBY is not something that the research supports as a, as a thing? Um, and, yeah, Helena, why do you think that everybody just assumes that to be true? Um, I think it's just a very attractive term. Um, it also has, a, you know, kind of a ring to it. Like if you say NIMBY, it's, 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 it's short. Um, and I think it just makes it easy to kind of refer to opponents in that way and to mm. also explain their opposition. Because as humans, we like the, you know, I'm a psychologist by background, um, so I know quite a bit about this. As humans, we, we always love simple short explanations that kind of help us to structure our thinking and our look on the world but yeah um, yeah I think for me personally like it's really nice to feel like oh people are just so dumb like um you know if it wasn't for those nimbies then we would just have all of the renewable energy that we need and everything would be would be great um you know I think yeah it's easy to just think that you know certain people are being stupid or selfish and that's the reason for all your problems um it's a very nice simple thing in a way for I, I don't know I guess um have to feel a bit smug and yeah uh I don't know feel nice about yourself and <laughs> in contrast to other people which is not not the nicest kind of uh way to interpret the world yeah, and maybe adding to that, I think the term has also been instrumentalized a lot over time, especially by uh, key decision makers, because it's an easy way for them to discard uh, counter arguments. So they can just say, oh, those, you know, those silly nimbies, and then they're done mm. with it. And they don't really have to mm. look into why is it maybe that people are opposing and is there maybe something going wrong and we should do something about it? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move on then so if it's not so simple and so just misguided as NIMBY then why do we see opposition to you know local opposition to projects then I guess you have to kind of get a little bit more um and you have to understand a bit more more deeply if you can't just write it all off as NIMBYism right so what's the what's the more accurate picture um, yeah, so generally you can say that there are five main factors that influence um, the local acceptance of a, a wind project, for example. 
Um, so five factors that influence someone's attitude towards a local uh, project. Um, and the first one is um, how does the project impact the local economy? Um, so for example, does it generate any uh, tax revenues for the local municipality? Um, is there possibility for financial participation of uh, residents? That's the first factor. Then the second factor is um, what is the person's individual attitude to the energy transition? Um, so if, for example, if I'm, um, if I'm in favor of the energy transition and I understand that it's important and that we need to make this shift from fossil fuels to renewables, then it's also easier to accept having such a uh, project in my vicinity, right? Um, and then the third factor, um, it's actually a combination of uh, related concepts um, and they're all connected to justice. Um, so we have a procedural or process justice on the one hand and distributive or outcome justice on the other hand. Um, so process justice basically just refers to um, having a meaningful participation of groups and individuals in the planning um, and decision making around the project. And then outcome justice refers to um, the you know, fair allocation of resources, benefits, and also impacts connected to the project. Um, so if, if I rate um, the project as higher on these two forms of justice, then I also tend to have a more positive attitude towards the uh, project. And what also you know, plays into that is um, whether the parties responsible for the projects are transparent and open, and I perceive them also as credible. Um, and there are two more factors. So the final two are um, avoidance or mitigation of project impacts. So how do I rate um, the impact that the project has on the local environment, um, including both nature and, and people? So you can think of things like uh, noise pollution, uh, shadows, but also like true environmental impacts on flora and fauna. And then finally, the last factor is um, social norms or rather perceived social norms regarding the project. Um, so do I think that other community members are also in favor of the project or do I think that they're not in favor of the project? And that will also influence my own attitude towards the project. So those five factors are you know, quite a good summary of the determinants of people's opposition or support for local projects. Okay. Um, I was just, I should have brought it up before because you sent me, you sent me that paper that you're talking about and I could have had the, the diagram up to show all of those factors together, but I wasn't, wasn't able to find that while you were talking. Um, all right. So, I mean, that makes, that makes sense that it's a combination of, of those things. So the five was economical impacts, attitude to the energy transition, the planning process, impact on nature and residents and social norms. Um, and then all of those together, you know, um, yeah, helps to um, shape somebody's opinion of, of how they're going to feel about it. Um, but I mean, uh, those something that a developer can hope to change uh you know like how how would it um how would you go about it if you wanted to if you know you wanted to put a project in a community where a lot of people had you know negative uh, opinions due to these factors which ones of those can change and when would you need to go about doing that change is it before you even announce the project because i you know usually the opposition starts when the project's announced and um it seems like by then people have chosen a team and you know it would be hard to change somebody's mind once they've already been you know vocal about being opposed to it right yeah well if you look at the the factors, you will see that there's only really one factor that the developer has no influence over, and that's uh, someone's personal attitude towards the energy transition, right? Um, but all the other factors are kind of malleable, and um, there are a lot that developers can do to you know change people's uh, perceptions of these things. Um, so starting with project impacts, for example, um, so you can obviously do a lot of things to to um, to reduce impacts as, as much as, as possible. Um, so in fact, there's this kind of hierarchy that developers should, should be using in developing uh, projects. So they should always try to, to mm. avoid impacts whenever possible, um, then mitigate if they cannot avoid them, and only as a last resort, uh, compensate for them. 
and that can be financial compensation and i think we'll get into that later but it can also be compensation in, in terms of you know if you know that there are some negative ecological impacts you could maybe create um, space somewhere else for species to thrive so that could also be a form of compensation okay that's interesting because um you know and actually there's a comment that i got from um one of the the patreon team um, about this um, another Peter from Patreon asks is compensation the answer um, yeah or education and experience more effective but in you know people that I talk to I mean it's kind of like everybody says in the wind industry um, the only people who oppose wind farms are the ones who aren't getting payments for the turbines being on their land you know like the the most aggrieved person is going to be the person living next door to somebody who's getting you know payments for having hosting wind farms on their land and um, definitely when you know you talk with people about how we're going to manage installing a whole lot more transmission than we've um, been doing in the past. Everyone says you've got to, you know, go to the wind model and pay people to host it. Um, I know a lot of places the government can just acquire, you know, the, the land that they need um, if it's in the national interest and people, you know, tend to think maybe that's not the smartest thing to just tell people that they're going to have this technology they don't want on their land. Um and the answer is just yeah, just just pay them, um, and everything's fine. But now you're saying that's the that's the last the last tool that should come out of the toolbox. Um, so can you explain a bit more about what those what the better options would actually look like? Um, so what I meant with last resort is, of course, financial benefits are extremely important because they really matter for um, outcome justice, as I um, was explaining before. But with compensation of impacts, I might I meant more like if, if there are some impacts of the projects that really cannot be uh, avoided or mitigated in any way, then you might have to think of compensation. Um, but that's then impact specific compensation, right? So for example, if there's a group of residents that live really close to the project and um, they can hear the turbines especially well, then they might deserve some kind of special compensation. But you can also think of compensation more generally, and I think that's always um, something that should be considered in the planning process as well. Okay, so, so it's more like you wouldn't just pay somebody to put up with being annoyed by a noise or a health impact or you know whatever that they might experience or think that they're experiencing. Yeah, first you should always try and find out what is you know, what is really the reason for them to to be so annoyed by it or to, to think that they're going to be annoyed by it? Because a lot of times this also happens before the project has even been realized, right? So people mm. don't know the true impacts yet. They're just kind of, you know, worried about the worst case scenario. Um, and what you'll find is that when you really have an open conversation with people and you also give them some, um, you know, some influence over the decision making, maybe to change the location of certain turbines so that they're not, you know, facing their bedroom uh, window or whatever. Um, then a lot of times this will already help to kind of alleviate people's uh, worries and concerns. Right. Okay. Um, and do you know any other, like any projects or countries maybe that approach this in like a gold standard way? That if you're a developer that wants to, you know, do a project and you want to get, get the community acceptance right, um, where would you look to for an example? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that there's one country that's doing it right because it's very, um, you know, dependent on the, on the particular developer and also the local context. Um, so that's why I also always say there's not a one size fits all approach, right? Because um, it, it varies a lot across contexts. So even if you have one and the same developer, the project might go well in one place, but not so good in another place. Um, so as a developer, it's also extremely important that you're flexible and responsive to the local context and the needs that arise there. Um, but you brought up Denmark earlier and you said that nobody in Denmark is opposing wind turbines, um, which um, is now slowly changing. So um, yeah, back in the day, that's how it was. And um, mm -hmm. I think the main reason for that is that a lot of the uh, projects were initiated by local communities. So they were also owned uh, by local communities. So um, they had to carry the burden, but obviously they were also reaping all the benefits of the projects. And that's now changing as projects are becoming bigger, turbines are becoming bigger, 
everything um, is starting to be more expensive and kind of you know going uh, on a higher scale and it's it's becoming increasingly more difficult for communities to uh, own and operate their own projects. Mm. Yeah, and I know, I, I mean, I was, I was mostly talking about the fact that like in Denmark or at least I was in Jutland, um, you just can't get that far away from wind turbines. So um, you just, you couldn't, you couldn't live there if they really bothered you so much. But um, I don't think that there was like a mass migration when, <laughs> you know, in the 90s when they started putting those out. But at the same time, um, yeah, I don't think that people want a whole lot more onshore wind in Denmark uh, either because it's, it, it is kind of full. Um, I mean, it's not totally full, but, you, you know, there's, there's already a lot of turbines around. Um, but it is interesting. I think in the UK as well, the reason why, uh, probably the reason why the UK is pushing so fast ahead on offshore wind, or at least they're trying to, um, has been largely because they feel like they're stuck, not able to put more onshore wind because, um, yeah, people, uh, at least, uh, you know, a small enough or big enough and vocal enough group, whether it's, you know, actually big, um, it appears big uh, of people who are opposing it. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's um, go to some viewer questions or comments now. Um, all right, some political ones. I usually usually don't don't talk about about them. Um, uh, yeah, okay, here's one I was looking for. Um, Team Taj says wind farms have a far greater visual impact as opposed to, say, solar farm with large-scale battery storage. In Australia, I believe that solar projects would be the better investment over wind. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the the visual impact? Is that, you know, a major thing? And is that really something that people consider, changing out one type of renewable energy for another where you know people don't don't you know if someone didn't want a wind farm would you say okay we'll swap to a, a solar farm then yeah so when you look at the research you see that acceptance is somewhat higher for um for solar than wind energy exactly for some of these reasons like lower visual impact right also um almost no noise impacts um and people also believe that it has a lower ecological impact. I, I, you know, I'm not an ecologist, so I don't know the research about that. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, people often associate, um, you know, birds getting shredded with, with wind turbines. And obviously that aspect is missing from solar farms. Um, but the thing is that often people are not in a position to, to, to say we would rather want this uh, than that, right? It, it, usually the way it goes is that, um, there are some zoning plans, so a site has been identified as being suitable for siting um, wind turbines, for example, and then a developer um, wants to secure the sites and makes, you know, comes up with a proposal. Um, so it's often not in, you know, the community's hand to say, oh, no, we much rather put solar here. But you mm. can really do a lot about the planning process and how you involve people in the, in the planning process. Um, and the visual, so the visual impact aspects of wind turbines that also falls um, under these five determinants of local acceptance that I summarized earlier. So that would be part of, you know, uh, the impact, the project impact in general. And one part of that is, of course, also visual impacts. And there are ways for developers to play around with that. Um, like I said before, sometimes it's possible to move turbines a little bit. So that's, you know, you have you reduce noise impacts um, and also visual impacts. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I know I've um, looked into the the birds issue with wind turbines a bit and did a video on that recently. And I, I think that's a case where public per perception is way out of line with, with the reality. Um, so that's interesting. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know what you can do about, <laughs> about public perception. But, I, I mean, I have learned um, from, yeah, the infrasound thing that it's not enough to just say that's not a real problem. Um, I don't need to think about it because it becomes a real problem if you've got protests at your, you know, your site. Um, yeah, okay. So, I mean, that's interesting. Um, it's a couple here on payments then. So, first of all, um, Tom... Uh, but Hansen uh, has made a comment about Denmark. So he says there is lots of opposition here in Denmark, both towards wind and solar when they are near to where you live. 
many now expect compensation just for being able to see the windmill from the property, which is, yeah, wild to me because there's so many around and, you know, um, you're obviously not going to go retroactively and say to someone who built a, you know, a wind farm in 2005, hey, you know, you need to pay me now. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. And yeah, I think Denmark gets like 50% of their electricity from wind now. So it's like if you're anti-wind in Denmark, does that mean that you're, you know, happy to cut your electricity usage by 50%? It would be be surprised. So that's interesting. Um, and then from Alan Hall asked, what impact do payments to locals have on success of, of projects? I mean, is it as simple that you can ignore all of your five factors um, that you mentioned if you just, yeah, just provide money payments to people? Um, well, I want to start by saying acceptance cannot be bought. Um, so yes, financial benefits and financial participation opportunities for local communities are a really powerful tool that developers can use, but they can also backfire when they're not done right, um, because they can also be perceived as bribery. So um, what matters there is really the implementation. Like, um, and there are different factors that come into that. So if you want, I can go into more detail. Um, let's move on. Maybe we can come back to it if we, um, if we have time. But yeah, I did uh, mention that I wanted to keep on keep on pressing on um okay so we've talked a lot about community acceptance and then there was another term that i wanted to raise which is social license because that term gets used a, a lot in australia now at least i don't know if that's a, a global term but um yeah can you, you you can probably answer that for me Helena, and can you define what that means exactly uh yeah so social license refers to a type of contract or agreement between uh, a company or an industry and a local community or a certain group of uh, stakeholders and the difference between social license and social acceptance is that um, social license usually pertains, uh, as i said to you know an individual company or industry that has a significant uh, social and environmental impact so it doesn't just, it's not just used in the context of renewable energy, but also uh, mining, for example, and any large scale infrastructure uh, projects. And um, so SLO, that's the abbreviation, um, it also recognizes that um, a, a company's right to operate is not just based on uh, legal permits and you know fulfilling regulations, but also on this social consent from, from a community. Uh, and it requires this ongoing uh, dialogue and trust building, um, you know, between the company who wants to develop a project and um, the stakeholders. And then the term social acceptance is um, used more generally and applied more broadly. So uh, it could also be used for organizations or industries that have uh, low social and environmental impacts. Okay. And so when I hear the term social license and when I use it I'm not really thinking of a you know a literal um, document official document but is that how it it is used sometimes so do you mean like an actual agreement between a, a community and developers um, I mean the construct itself refers more to an informal agreement um, but of course, for a specific projects, uh, if the developer decides to do so in collaboration with the local community, they could also put something in writing. But the term itself doesn't imply that there's really like a written contract. It refers more to this informal mm. agreement and it's not legally binding in most cases. Okay. Um, all right. Can we talk a bit about community ownership in the literal sense? Do you have... Um, yeah, do you know much about how that can be, yeah, how that interacts with community acceptance? Because it's something that I see a lot in the comments here and feel myself personally that, you know, like when you feel ownership of, of something, um, not just that you're like financially benefiting it from it, but, you know, just that you are a part owner, then you're much more likely to feel kind of positive feelings towards it. Um, I, I know there's not so much community yeah community so many community owned projects of this kind now i i mentioned that there have historically been some in denmark but i don't think that there's like a lot of new ones in denmark and um i've been looking into it to try and find somewhere that i can you know personally and invest some money in um local renewable energy and there's a bit around but not a whole lot do you know if if that 
is a, a potential solution to getting communities on board? And have you seen uh, many good experiences with that? Yeah, for sure. So when you look at the literature, what you will see is that community owned projects tend to be more accepted by the local community. Um, and there's a, a bunch of reasons for that, really. And they all tap into these these five factors that I was illustrating earlier. Um, and I think the main kind of the main driver here is um, that community owned projects tend to score high on process justice and also on outcome justice. Mm. Um, because, uh, you know, if the project is owned by the community, then obviously there's a, a strong local involvement in the planning and setting up and maybe even operating the project. Uh, and same goes for the outcomes, um, because then the community has uh, decision making power over how they want to distribute uh, the outcomes, such as uh, financial benefits among the community. Hmm. OK, um, yeah, just. It it feels very nice community owned projects do you ever see is it something that a you know like a a big developer a, you know company could do to kind of split off a portion of it and say you, you know we've got 10 percent of this project is going to be available for community investment is that is that something people do at all yeah so community ownership can range from like full ownership where really the community is completely in charge of the entire project uh, to just shared ownership. And when we talk about shared ownership, it's usually between 20 and 50% of the project that's owned by, by the community. Um, so, you know, you can have either or. And as I was saying before, so in Denmark, in, in the early days of wind energy development, a lot of the projects were community led and owned. But now as projects are becoming uh, bigger and thus more expensive, it's increasingly more difficult for communities to actually pull this off by themselves. And because developers are also starting to recognize the benefits of including communities more in the developments uh, of their projects, they're also starting to offer more, um, you know, these opportunities for people to become uh, financially involved, for example, by buying shares and uh, whatnot. So there's a number of ways that that can be done also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I can definitely say it, it sounds a lot more feasible to, you know, roll out a, um, to, get together as a community and build a solar farm than a winter uh, yeah wind farm with modern wind turbines they're just not it's not so straight, straightforward to just whack a couple of them in the ground um yeah so yeah that's interesting that you say there's a new model okay so um there's one more topic that we had on the list which was community engagement best and actual practices and i know we've already kind of touched on bits of that already but could you kind of tie it together like what what should you do if you've got uh you know if you want to install a wind farm somewhere where you know that there has you know in the nearby areas there's been opposition or yeah transmission is the the hot topic now or anything else what should the developer be doing and what kinds of yeah, what common mistakes do you see being made that yeah, aren't in line with that best practice? Yeah, yeah. So when we talk about uh, best practices for community engagement, I think uh, n the number one thing is to start engagement as early as possible. Um, so ideally before project application, um, because then you have the most flexibility and, and opportunity for the local community to also have an influence on the decision making. Um, so on the flip side, what's often done wrong is that people are not uh, sufficiently included at an early stage of planning the project. And then they feel like, um, you know, all the major decisions have already been made behind uh, their back. And uh, often that leads to a lot of frustration and also, um, how would you call that? Like people tend to be more suspicious then about um, the intentions of the, of the developer. So starting uh, engagement as early as possible is is definitely essential. But yeah, there are more things that should be done. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's it's got to be tricky, right? Because yeah, on the one hand, if you come with a full plan, fully planned project, and you know have a town hall meeting and say we want your input, but you know it's finished, then that is hard to take that anyway but cynically you know obviously you don't care what they have to say because you can't change it but on the other hand if you just come with an idea and you haven't done any 
planning yet, then um, that's also kind of, you know, a bit crazy because you you couldn't answer anyone's questions because you don't know what your project's going to look like. So I guess that's the kind of thing where it, it sounds easier in principle than it probably is to achieve in practice. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's also where uh, theory and recommendations often clash with reality. So when I'm reading the literature, uh, I'm often reading like, yeah, start engagement as early as possible. But then when I talk to developers and I'm asking them, how are you doing it? And you know, at what point are you involving uh, residents? Have you already secured a site when you start to involve residents? Usually they say, yes, we have already secured a site. And I'm telling them, but you know, this, this might not be the best way to go about it. And they say, yeah, but there are also a lot of practical implica implications that we have to consider. For example, they have to make sure that there's even land that they can lease, that there's mm. possibilities to connect to the grids, you know, that they're not violating any of the existing local regulations. Um, mm. So usually before community engagement starts, there's already a dialogue between the developers and some key stakeholders, such as local authorities and maybe landowners. Um, mm. But, you know, developers have to be considerate of the fact that just having this dialogue ongoing might already kind of offset uh, upset some of the other community members. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, you also, I guess you can't just yeah, go around to every potential site and start, you know, an official consultation process because until you've got a project, you probably don't have any um, financing to actually, you know, spend money going around talking to people. So, yeah, again, one of those things that's probably really hard to achieve in reality. Yeah. Um, okay, and what about any other kinds of uh, of yeah, best practices in what way, like, obviously, you, if you're going to consult with people with a genuine intention, then there must be some sorts of changes that developers can make based on community input. What types of things do you see developers being flexible on um, and, yeah, actually changing? Um, yeah, I think that really depends on the developers. So um, some developers have understood that the more flexibility they show, the more success they're going to have in realizing the project, but other developers are a bit more reluctant to make any changes to their project. But typically what I've heard of is um, changing uh, the number of turbines, for example, uh, maybe changing the height of turbines, um, changing the exact location of the turbines. Um, things like that, but also, you know, financial um, benefits to so talking about how can the local community be rewarded for hosting this project. Um, so, for example, you could set up a community fund and then you can uh, discuss with the local community what is the money, what should the money be used on, you know, for example, do you need local services, infrastructure, do you want to have financial support for the local sports team or the kindergarten or build more playgrounds? Um, mm. Or if there are a lot of concerns about um, impacts on nature, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, there's sometimes also developers buy or lease uh, another plot of land and then they create some kind of habitat where species can uh, locate. Yeah. Okay. Those are good good suggestions. And I have definitely heard um, heard of success stories where, yeah, that's built up you know, resources for the community, um, not just for people that happen to have a wind turbine on their um, on their farm. Um, yeah, okay, so we're running a little bit out of time, but um, we're getting close to the end anyway. Uh, I wanted to do a couple more viewer questions. So this one from DJ Laundry List, um, how could climate change activists, those who block rights, go to fashion shows, best direct their effort and maybe to make it something more in line with what um, your research is about, Helena, like if you were to advise somebody that was in a community that was going to have a, a project developed there that they were concerned about aspects of it how do you think that they should go about you know getting it changed in the way that they wanted to what what yeah or maybe i can rephrase that like what what types of community um action do you see being successful um i think it's important to to seek a dialogue with the developer um but it, of course, also always depends on the intention of that particular developer. 
if they're open to talk to you and if they're open to you know incorporating your feedback or not um but it always depends a bit on the setup of the specific project um you know if the local authorities are also involved i think it also makes sense to to go through them because that's more like an official channel and you might have more leverage than if you just show up as a bunch of uh, residents because obviously local authorities also want to keep keep the peace in the community they don't they don't want the community to you know erupt in conflict over the proposed plans <laughs> yeah yeah okay makes sense um all right and then one more um Alan Hall asks, if people are opposed to wind turbines, are they also opposed to coal power plants, nuclear power plants, hydro dams? So I, I guess that's kind of one aspect to it. But do you tend to see that people have, you know, just um, oppose anything in their area? Or do you think that there are like technology specific um, problems that people have? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what I can tell you is that, um, as I said also earlier, that uh, social acceptance tends to be the highest for solar power. Um, and so of, of all the renewable energies, highest for solar power and lowest for biogas. Um, and I think if I recall correctly, it's, it's been a while since I looked at like national or international surveys on this, but if I recall correctly, fossil fuels um, and also nuclear power tend to be you know, liked even less, but I think that's also very context specific. So if you live in a country with a lot of nuclear power, like France, for example, or Belgium, I could imagine that your attitude towards that technology is also somewhat different than in Germany, where we had a huge resistance against nuclear power. Mm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, let's leave that there then. That's been very interesting. And um, yeah, I feel a little bit um, humbled to realize, you know, how much I kind of just talked about these topics, like uh, the answer was obvious, but turned out to be, you know, quite different than what I thought. Um, I think there's definitely a real danger when uh, like engineers, wind energy engineers only talk to other wind energy engineers or, you know, like whatever technology you're involved with, you only, if you only talk to experts, then you know that, you know, a lot of these pe people's fears about these technologies aren't true. And so it's easy to just kind of dismiss them like, um, yeah, it's not even, it's not a real problem. So you don't need to deal with it. Um, but yeah, I think it's really good to get people from different professional backgrounds involved um, so that you yeah, not just talking to people exactly like yourself all the time and can get a better idea about how things are likely to go in the real world because, yeah, that's where the projects have to go after all. <laughs> um, okay, so just wrapping up, um, thanks again to, um, yeah, we'll start with thanks, Helena, for coming and sharing your research and, um, yeah, other people's research on this topic. It's been really great. Um, also, thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon team. Um, and yeah, I always ask ahead of live streams. I ask the Patreon people to give suggestions for questions and directions where they want the, um, the topics to go, ideas for future videos, all that sort of thing. So definitely that's a big part of um, the yeah, finances that make the channel work. So if you'd like to join us, and the link is in the description. Um, and then also, thanks again to the sponsor of these live streams, WeatherGuard Lightning Tech. WeatherGuard also have a great uh, tech newsletter and a podcast, which I co-host with Alan Hall and Joel Saxon and now Phil Sotaro as well each week. Links to all those are in the description. We talk about all kinds of clean energy tech news. And in the latest podcast episode, we talk about flow batteries um, and some yeah program programs that are underway in the U.S., um, and also some more, oh, we've been talking pretty much every week about the current wind industry crisis with there's some technical defects and supply chain issues. So, um, yeah, check that out for sure. Um, and the next video that I have coming up is going to be on Bex Bioenergy with Carbon Capture. should be out in the next couple of days. So, yes. Um, and, yeah, just one more big thank you to Helena and to everybody for watching. Um, and, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks.